Hello and welcome to the Cube Pod, episode seventy-seven. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, salute! Good to see you, Johnny Boy. What's <laughs> happening? We've been all up and place. up and down the world. I'm passing on East Coast. You're going West Coast. Um, I'm back in Palo Alto. You're back in Boston. Yeah, I'm down the Cape. Nice. How's the weather? It's awesome today. It's really beautiful. It's peak. Going to be peak weekend next week's peak colors. Seattle was great. We had the football game last night. It was phenomenal. New York City was amazing. NYSE, two days, wall to wall. You know what that's like. What was that? <laughs> what was up in uh, Seattle? So AWS had an analyst meeting. There were a lot of analysts there. There were like, I don't know, over 100, maybe 100. The analyst week? Analyst Summit, AI Summit. <clears throat> they had, supposed to be Matt Wood, but Matt Wood's not there anymore. Um, so they had um, their CIO evangelist, uh, gave us like kind of the intro very inspired um not a lot of detail and not a ton of substance frankly about you know product but it was more like how they're advising cios to think about gen ai and then this guy scott whitmouth actually gave a pretty good talk got into products all the it gave us like a preview of what's coming at reinvent um which obviously i can't say but but i would just say this that it's a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about with the future of ai and gen ai i, I think they're going to hit on some of that um maybe not as much as i would have liked but but we will see because they didn't tell us everything you know and then we had a bunch of one-on-ones and then they took us to the football game they had you know their suite and overlooking the field and um uh, Seattle, the stadium is right in the middle of the city, as you know. I've never been to a game there. What was it like? They lost. Oh, Thank God. God. I had it's the, so I had the, I had loud. The my pick. The fans are great. First of all, there was a lot of red there. There was a lot of 49er fans. And so, but the fans, the Seattle fans are so loud. And the the stadium has these fins over the, the sides. So that it, there's an echo. It's a bounce back. And so that's one reason it's so loud. The other reason is, even when the, the the team is down, the crowd is into it. They're loud. Like I'm used to Gillette when when the when the Patriots are down, everybody sits in their hands, like fair weather fans, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but Seattle fans were into it. I mean, really into it. It was super loud, but but San Francisco pulled away. Kittle had a great game. It was but it was a lot of fun. And well, uh, the busy week for you. I know you were uh beginning of the week. Take me through the uh NYSC media week drop in that you did two days uh, in our QB studios on the floor of the NYSC. Um, give, yeah, me, so, give, me, give me the details because I flew out to go to the SAS event. SAS had their annual SAS championship, played in the Pro-Am, which is great. Had fun two days. Also got to meet all the executives again and get the lowdown on their IPO and and uh, what they're doing. Well, what happened at NYSC? Hey, you got to tell me about that. <clears throat> so it, it sort of was a, a mirror of what you did a couple of weeks ago, a digital twin to a physical event. So they had their tech summit, which was, I don't know, maybe 150 tech leaders, uh, investors, uh, you know, a bunch of guys from Greylock were there. We, we had one of the one of the companies, you know, funded companies on. Uh, Vast Data was there. Uh, Cloudflare was there. Uh, you know, a bunch of guys like Lambda and, you know, the other core weave competitors. Uh, uh, Crusoe was there. Uh, on and on. Of course, so that was separate. That was Monday night and Tuesday. And so that was an all day Tuesday thing. And then Monday was Oracle Day. Sonny Singh, who runs you know banking and financial services for Oracle, rang the bell. Last year, Saffer ran it. So Sonny had a little CIO event in the morning, um, all day actually, when you know he I crashed it at breakfast and you know went to get you know the coffee hour, met a bunch of people there. He came on at one o'clock in the afternoon. He was awesome. He lives in Palo Alto. And he knows about the cube and he knows about the studio. So he wants to come in and do more stuff with us. That was amazing. And then we was just like, you know what it's like. It, it was we, at last, last Saturday, last Friday, rather, I was at a wedding in South Carolina. I remember when we did cube pod, mm -hmm. we had no guests. We just put the word out. We, I think we did 18 interviews in two days, maybe even 20. It was just wall to wall. I didn't move all day. I didn't have time to go to the bathroom. Even it was just nuts, but really good content. We'll be releasing that probably next week because uh we had we had like four events this week right we had we had the nyse we had the you you were down at sas we had the cloudera event and we had teradata 
mm-hmm. I guess we had uh, eight, five AWS uh, AI Summit. We had five events this week. I mean, ma- amazing. How was North Carolina? How'd you do? Well, first of all, the event coverage is phenomenal. Um, Terra Data and Cloudera uh, is awesome. Your content, but Dave, was phenomenal as well. I know we're streaming that out, but I did get to see your interview with Trinity on the Oracle coverage. That was phenomenal. Um, so a lot to unpack on those events, but but the uh, the SAS, um, I was invited last year because you know, we do their event, and they know I like to golf, so I did the champ- championship pro and last year. Got invited back this year because I had opening my calendar and also, you know, met with them about what their their AI strategy is. Met with Brian Harris again and the team. You know, SaaS is killing it on terms of they have a lot of customers. I won't say old customers, but they have a lot of legacy customers that have a lot of predictive analytics. They've been doing it for years. They spent a billion dollars in R and D. Think about that. They are, they're flush with cash. And Dr. Goodnight, as you know, legendary founder. Uh, built the culture and stayed private. And he, you know, he rewards people with a lot of cash and 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 benefits like the culture there and the amenities and the hospitality that they provide their employees is second to none. They're well well known. It's like one of the best places to work every year on the on the leaderboard. But you know, they they haven't gone public, but they can go public. And when they go public, it'll be a monster IPO because they just generate so much cash. Now, you know, people think might think there's not a lot of growth there, 10, 15 percent growth maybe, but they're already big. Right. And they're already big with, with cash flow. So, you know, I think that's great. And again, I played in the event pro am. So Patrick Harrington gave me a big hug. He's actually in third place type of second right now. Um, you played with him last year, didn't you? I played with him last year. I didn't, I didn't play with him this year. Cause he got in a little bit late. Did you play with this year? Uh, I played with a uh, uh, boo weekly. Um, yeah. And he was cool. Any good tips? Oh yeah. Lower the hands. I once, once I did that, I was, I was hitting him. Okay. I was shanking it big time. First what five holes. Hell over the place. I'm like, oh boy. What do you, not, what do you mean? What does that pretty. mean? Like, choke up in the club? No, I didn't. When I'm addressing the ball, my hands were too high up. Um, and, you know, um, if you remember, um, guys like Fred Couples and Ray Floyd used to have their hands, arms up, hands were up higher up, just drop them down in natural position below the belt buckle. So, yeah, you just keep your hands a little bit lower at address just to keep balance. And so I was just kind of off my swing. I mean, I was swinging good, but just my hands were in the wrong position. So, which is inconsistent, but once I fixed that, which is great, like like playing ice hockey, slap shot, happy Gilmore. Uh, <laughs> you have any good shots? Oh yeah, I hold out from uh, fifty yards. Two years in a row, I hold out from the fairway or the grass. So they yeah. think I'm like a big time player. I'm like I play once a month at best. Come on, you know. So <laughs> you're the best non golfer I've ever seen because you don't golf that much. No, How many times at all? I golf once a month at best. I hit the range with my son but you know i like hitting the ball so maybe 15 times a year 10 15 times a year oh not even not even like i think like <laughs> that's, eight. that's amazing it's confident I mean, you know i like to hit the irons because i played hockey as growing up so to me golf hitting irons is easy hitting the hitting the driver is hard for me so and from a golf standpoint you know then you get to all the other stuff the chipping and the putting <laughs> it's hard it's a hard game oh uh, it, it's fun but you know boo wheatley is tied for seventh He's minus three. That's cool. My guy. So really good group of people. Again, that was fun. Um, I was, you know, doing some work down there. It was not look like I was having a good time. I did, but you know, SAS is about to go public uh, or they're thinking about going public. Um, that's been reported. So it's out there. Um, we'll see. They may stay private. The, the founder might want to keep it private. So um, they certainly have very, very strong product group right now. They got a young management team. When I say young, they're basically really current, um, Brian Harris, Shaddy, uh, who runs product management. I play, she played with the head of product management on the analytics side, platform side. Um, he's awesome. Um, they have some really good product managers. So, you know, I like, I like their chances. I, and I think, you know, people like look at Salesforce, look at SaaS, they look at, you know, some of these companies and because they're not the shiny new toy, people dismiss them. And, you know, it's my premise. And even, even we talked about this last week on the pod, even up in Seattle to a drone event, and you know, the, the scuttlebutt was, oh, yeah, they're, they're old. They'll get replaced by the next wave of startups. You know, I think that's true if they're laggards and they don't innovate. But, you know, companies like Salesforce and SaaS, they have customer data. They've been doing data stuff for years. So um, building abstractions and taking advantage of the AI is going to be a win for them. But at the end of the day, Nothing's going to happen on the agentic side from in a meaningful way until the infrastructure and the data layer gets resolved. 
And what the number one conversation again, Dave, continues to be governance. So, you know, um, cataloging, governance, governance is a huge thing because if you don't have governance, you can't manage the data. And as data becomes a scalable, you're talking about, you're talking about really not a viable AI and, and people want their data to be protected and they want the risk management address. So, you know, if you train a data set and someone actually has an, you know, a data set that they gets in there, like passwords, how do you unwind that? So I think there's a huge conversation being had, and this has not been public yet. Uh, I haven't seen it except for us on the cube and within our network of, of, of friends is the word resilience. Um, we hear about cyber resilience, right? You know, that's really discussed around ransomware and recovery, backup and recovery. So cyber resilience. And we got an event coming up, Christoph Bertrand and our team's doing a, um, a, a multi um, industry show in December here in the cube on cyber resilience. If you're listening, you're into it. It's going to be a lot around more cyber resilience, more known definition. But if you take the concept of being resilient, how do you get those passwords back if they're trained in the LLM? There's no observability. There's all kinds of um, data explainability, supply chain of the data. So there's a huge action right now on governance and redoing that. So I tell you right now, companies like SaaS, like Salesforce, who have been doing this stuff with data, I think I'm almost are freed. The shackles are off the off the off off them because now they can do things with data, like harmonizing the, the layers. And and this is huge. I know you've got a lot of research on this, and I know you agree, but this still, this is an open book right now. This is not closed chapter. This is developing right in front of our eyes. So again, a lot of buzz on Ingentic, but the sasses of the world are very much like, you know, hype cycle, but it's real. And they're really taking a pragmatic approach. So it's going to be very interesting to see the ROI start kicking in when people like the sasses and the sales forces and the Teradatas of the world who have uh, experience and the question really is culturally, can they transition, right? That's one. And then two, they got to they got to get the technology right, just like what Salesforce is doing with with their leader. It's run by a technical person. He's been on the cube. So um, huge topic, huge topic. Well, we, know, we know Brian Harris pretty well, the CTO. And to your point about they spend on, on R and D, and they, you know, they, first of all, they have a huge install base. I mean, SaaS has been around since I was in college. We used to use SaaS was our sort of analytics package you know but they didn't call it analytics back then it was statistics but they announced uh, a couple of years ago they announced via SAS via that's their cloud play and it's an in-memory analytics engine and it's fast and it's good and you talk to customers about it and they they like it a lot and it's good for you know, predictive analytics and you know, they do they serve bi you know visualization they get they do they're doing a lot in ai and machine learning and you know, what if forecasting and Monte Carlo modeling, I mean, all that stuff. I mean, that stuff still in vogue. And so, you know, I'm pretty stoked about that. And yeah, they're going to bring a Gentic and <clears throat> I was talking to Floyer today about that. And he's, he's actually not that high on a Gentic, but he's high on what he, what, what he, we kind of debated a little bit and, and because he's like, yeah, Gentic, it's, it's a stepping stone. I'm like, yeah, well, there's a lot of Why? stepping stones. Stepping stone to what? His, his vision is he sees a world of AI, I'll call it AI native workflows, which I kind of agree with, you know, those cloud native, he sees the world as AI native companies that have been built from the ground up with AI processes and workflows that can do things for, you know, one-tenth the cost or one-tenth the people than what you could do today. And I'm like, yeah, but like not every company is going to start from scratch. So you're going to bring agents into existing SaaS and existing workflows and eventually, you know, those two worlds are going to meet. But I, I think his point is you're going to see some big disruption. I totally agree, which is why it's so stupid that the FTC is now going after the what is now the old guard, Google, you know, breaking up Google <laughs> and Amazon antitrust. You know, that FTC won, not one, but that Amazon was trying to get it thrown out of court. Now they're going to proceed because they say Amazon is basically <laughs> causing prices to 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 be more expensive to go up, which is just again, right? I mean, Amazon has just done so much to lower prices, but anyway, I mean, they can make a case. They they used to make the case that Amazon was pricing too low, 
to beat competition. Now they're making the case that Amazon pricing too high. I don't know if we're going to talk about that today, but but there's uh, the Tesla thing was kind of interesting. All the all the all the Wall Street analysts are poo pooing at Tony Sakanagi and all those guys. But Dan Ives was I heard I heard him. He's all pumped up because he's you know he's like oh, this guy doesn't he doesn't he doesn't dislike anything. He that. doesn't just like anything. If it but moves, he loves it. You I know? think hey, were, something happened. A shiny new toy. People were underwhelmed, but I, I do think it's interesting. And Floyer actually thinks, irrespective of today, last night's announcement, which had no substance, but but his feeling is was talking about that too, that it's going to be like a home run. And I, don't know, I wouldn't bet against Elon. I mean, the guy makes rockets fly and then land back in the same spot. So. He can probably I don't pull think it Elon up. makes rockets fly. I think he just happens to own the company that makes rockets fly. But, you know, he has a vision. And I think, you know, what people don't know about Musk is he's very focused on things. And so if he wants to make something happen, he'll go after it. What gets him off the rails, so to speak, is the fact when he gets blockers thrown in front of him. And if it's if he can't control it like the government, he goes around it. Look what he did. He moved out of California because it's like California was, in his mind, corrupt and overregulated. Um, and so, and obviously the taxes are out of control, but you know, I mean, what, what's, what's not to like about someone who says, Hey, I'm going to build some scale around ride sharing. And why wouldn't you want to look at that? So I believe every innovation always has derivative works, whether it's fallout, uh, from a failure or as Steve jobs always used to like to point out, you know, you never start out, you end up, never end up where you started. It always changes. It takes a little craft and, and, you know, you, you get there if you know what your your vision is. And I think, yeah, I mean, I, I love it. I mean, I love it in the sense of, you know, are we analyzing it today in a vacuum? No, but if you take it on face value, it's essentially, it's a launch. It's a launch of a direction. So he's got a track record with Tesla. Uh, he's got a track record with SpaceX. Um, he's, he thinks like a modern inventor and wants to attract people like that. What's wrong with that? I mean, I love it. I mean, I'm not down on it at all. I just look at it and say, okay, let's see. Let's keep it going. Yeah, there's not there's not wasn't a lot there last night, but I do like the way he says, "Hey, I don't think of Tesla as a car company." You remember, people used to take it as an automobile or on, on you know a software device on wheels. He's basically you know looking at it maybe as a transportation you know engine. Or I think it's interesting if they can make this sort of autonomous driving work. I mean, it can be very disruptive to to uber i mean look at waymo it's amazing when you're in california now how many waymos with no yeah. drive i mean that's that was fantasy years ago now it's now it's reality i mean dave so much going on i, I want to get to a story that i want to talk to you about because I, we've been saying i think we actually said in the last pod um you know, core weave just got a line of credit for 650 million yeah um and and that's 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 news and we kind of knew that they had that debt going on but the real story is is that in 18 months, they've raised 12 billion. Unbelievable. Okay. So, um, and TensorWave, another company that we covered on Silicon Angle, I met some of the guys in Seattle last week. You know, they only raised 45 million, million, right? Billion, not billion. So again, they're going, you're partnering with AMD. Um, and look what they're doing. I think, I think you're going to start to see, and as NVIDIA starts releasing some of Blackwell's products, uh, and everyone's kind of jumping up. I have the next version. We'll get to that in a second. But this core we financing really kind of puts kind of the horses on the track now because you have funding. Blackwell and the NVIDIA new stuff is coming. You now have people who have been looking at NVIDIA for two years, hardcore, you know, your margin is my opportunity, that famous line. So now you have two years in of potential competition. Okay. Looking at this, going, I got to get in that market. Why is Nvidia going to run the table? So, Core Weave speaks to the clock that starts right now, which is who makes it, right? So, there's a lot. And I, and I remember I read that, I wrote, I had that post, and I called it the big short. Remember the at GPU short? I, I was saying the GPU short and kind of joking about the, you know, the big short, the movie and housing crisis, implying that there might be a GPU crisis in the sense of, Everyone's buying, 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 and then, okay, it crashes. I think, you know, I would revise that by saying everyone's buying, buying, buying. I don't have power. I can't run them at scale. I don't have the software. And now there's new stuff here. So you're seeing kind of like the next evolution of, I won't say Moore's Law, but natural price performance coming in and competition. So I think Core Weave with the funding 
Um, first of all, I think debt's dangerous. Obviously, you know how I feel about debt, but that's still a lot of uh, a debt credit line. So, but the twelve billion in equity—that's well, a lot of cash. To. So mm-hmm. the clock's on, uh, and we're going to see who's going to where the ROI comes from, where's that, where the results are going to come from. I mean, the cash flow to finance this. Now, I think it's a credit line, so I don't think it's going to be pure debt. And you have to obviously pay it back if it's a debt, and they use it, but. You know, you you start taking on this cat kind of capital, you got to get a payback, especially with so, debt. You got to you got to make some money. In other words, are, will the costs costs um, t- tamper down, and will revenue grow? Um, Rob Hof has um, a, a article on Silicon Angle with his team around OpenAI's projections. They're implying they're going to loot their losses will triple to fourteen billion. In 2026, that's three times uh, today's costs, and they're 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 saying a hundred billion in revenue. So, uh, I'll come back to Coreweed for a second, because I had two, actually three, guests on last this week at NYSE. Um, not Coreweed, but we had Lambda on. We had their head of strategy, uh, Sam Koshra Shahi, and then we had. Um, the co-founder of Crusoe, if you know those guys. Mm-hmm. Do you know Crusoe? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Robinson Crusoe? Like Chase Lockmiller is their um, yeah. CEO, and he uh, uh, founded the company with his high school buddy. And then Vast was on, Andy Pernsteiner. Um, and I saw Kirsten as well on Monday. Uh, Kirsten Bordner was kind of their you know, marketing jack-of-all-trades. Uh, at any rate... So the way I look at it is, first of all, they need a ton of dough because they need GPUs. And it seems to me like my sense is that CoreWeave has kind of done a lot of front loading of contracts. So they've locked people in, which is a good thing. My sense is with Lambda, they're sort of trying to make an AWS-like play that they're really trying to appeal to developers. So they're playing the long game. I think, and I, and, and I, and I talked to Sam about this. I'm like, your challenge is that you don't have an Amazon, you know, web services like. I mean, you're you're trying to be Amazon web services like in that you're appealing to developers, but you don't have what Bezos had, which was he. Remember, he took out all this debt, and because he was growing so fast, people didn't penalize him for it. Remember, he was losing money forever, um, but he was able to take out you know huge bond issues and things like that. And then Vast is like a supplier to all these guys. They supply to CoreWeave, they supply to Lambda, they supply to uh, uh, Crusoe. The interesting thing about Crusoe that I didn't know until I met Chase Monday night, they not only compete for the GPU cloud, they actually build data centers. So they have a near-term viable business model revenue stream that can complement what they're doing you know, on the cloud side. Now, I don't know what the economics are. I don't know, you know, building data centers, probably not as, well, maybe it is, I don't know, uh, economical. They don't have the network effects, obviously, that you get in 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 cloud. But I thought that was an interesting play. And then the other discussion that we had, I just want to put it out there is, I was at GTC last year with you. Mm-hmm. I remember walking by the HPE booth, and I don't know if you remember this, they had a picture of a Cray supercomputer. Uh, did you go there? Do you remember that? I do. So yeah. A supercomputer in a glass in, in casing, and they were showing the hoses. I don't know if you remember that. And it was a, it looked like amateur hour. It looked like these hoses were put together like for a, like a high school chemistry project. Um, and so I was asking him, like, is that a weak link? Like we're spending all this money on AI, and you got these hoses that look like they were in, you know, my garage. <laughs> this spaghetti and uh, like what's the connection integrity of those hoses and is that a weak link what have you remember dave hits like we're plumbing and your point was yeah and if the plumbing breaks no where's the cold clear water and you don't notice it until it breaks and then it's a disaster so if that's a weak link in the chain can you imagine if because like they don't know how to they can't do liquid cooling right and they don't have the the right connection integrity on hoses that the <laughs> <laughs> it crashes AI. And so 
there's that underbelly that has to evolve. I was just shocked. And, and uh, so that's something that we talked about because of the energy needs. You got to cool this stuff. We all know that liquid cooling, direct liquid cooling, even maybe immersive, immersive cooling is coming back. Um, but I think that's, it used to be IBM was dominant in that, that business with their mainframes. And then air, cool came, air cooling came in. And now liquid cooling is back and you get a lot of companies going after it, but there's no standards around that plumbing. And so it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. Yeah. I mean, to me, if you get the power uh, and cooling problem nailed, you do well because you can't run maximum capacity performance systems at scale without it. So I think data center design is going to be big. You know, at Climate Week, when I was down there for our media week at the NYSC, it was a big part of the UN Week, UN General Assembly. Plus, it was Climate Week, so a lot of sustainability conversations, Dave. Right. And the things that are going on now, I've never seen before in terms of data center. In the old days, it was like the facilities construction project. Hey, we'll get some land and get some fat pipe, bring some power in, um, connect to the grid. Now, that there's all kinds of holistic planning. Uh, companies like Tomorrow.io, a bunch of other ones um, doing the biosphere, big data analysis of our atmosphere, looking at climate, actually can look at the data and saying this part of the geography can have a mix of, you know, carbon footprint plus some sustainability just to max out and maximize the design of the data centers. He's starting to see data centers being designed systematically at the physical layer. I'm talking about the physical construction, which includes all the utilities. So that's going to be one. Um, and then obviously, you know, what is, how do you distribute that load? And one of the things that we're just starting to have more deeper research on right now, at least uh, from a team standpoint on our side, and you're seeing the conversations in some of the Cuban interviews, if you, if you unpack it a little bit, is that the conversation around distributing the data, okay, moving data bi-directionally between sources is a huge thing now, right? So you, as you look at capacity and on what's available for horsepower, compute, GPUs, whatever, you, that's going to be a distributed workload. So it's not just build the big fat data center. It's like, I got to have cloud. I got to use a cloud to on-prem to edge. And as edge comes out, and I was talking with Cole Crawford, who I interviewed with Vapor IO uh, this morning about this. Uh, we were actually texting on, not talking, texting on a plane when I was going back from uh, North Carolina, was, you know, this distributed nature is uh, a storage problem too, right? As we see with vast, vast data. So, Again, back to storage, Dave, you know, storage is not boring, right? Storage is probably one of the most exciting areas, again, continuing to be relevant in the conversation. Storage. You got you to store Storage is sexy again. It never was the unsexy. So but, but you got to store the data. You got to move it around. So, you know, the holy trinity, right? Storage, compute, and networking in the design of a distributed capacity. So you got to work, manage workloads. So I think that kind of orchestration will be a big discussion. And it's not easy to figure out because if you want to have true AI, you have to have data available and highly available all the time. And it's going to, it's going to require a new, new reset. So again, we've been pounding this on the queue, but I think when you start thinking about low latency uh, computer vision, for instance, okay, there's a, I snap a picture on, on a video. I can see something within milliseconds. It's got uh, uh, identification. It identifies the picture and breaks it down. We saw um, just last week or maybe earlier this week um, news that these Harvard students were using the new Ray-Ban metaglasses to dox people. They essentially takes a picture of them and then figures out who they are. I mean, that is like just insane. So this is the kind of stuff that this next level that we're seeing. So again, the core weaves, the funding rounds, it's all going to I won't say burst. I don't think there's going to be a bubble burst like the dot com. I think it's going to be the air will come out of the balloon because it, I, I just don't think it's going to be sustainable that everyone wins here because I don't think the apps will have true payout on scale except for a handful of consumer apps while the governance on the AI side and the enterprise will be the key because that's yeah. where the money will be in the enterprise because the power law that, that we published two years ago, not only is it relevant, it's still more relevant now because you can map companies to the power law. Actually, I was talking to a, uh, a New York bank last night um, uh, at, at an event, and they were saying that, yeah, we are going to have multiple models existing and talking to each other. It's our data. We're not going to let that out. We're going to keep it in, inside. So you're going to start to see, you know, companies, products have to operate on privileges, identity, access from 
enterprise like switches and knobs that people have to automate who's going to automate that so i think the enterprise value is going to take a little bit more work but that's going to be a huge upside and again we have to, i think we talked about it at length last week but you know i think i think core weave speaks to that that volume i think you're going to see meta get back in the game they're obviously got the developer market going great um i think amazon's going to have some good announcements i didn't i didn't get the scoop you did do you think it's going to be a good reinvent from a product announcement standpoint? I think well, this is Garmin's first CEO reinvent. I mean, he's been there. He's been at every reinvent, but he's now the CEO. And it's going to be interesting to see how he does the fire hose announcement and how it's, I think it's going to be more Andy like than it was Adam like. Um, and I, I just want to actually go back to something that you were, you were talking about in terms of carbon emissions. Did you see the story on um, Eric Schmidt this week? No. So he was vocal about now and stretch a said to me, yeah, it's because Google's so bad at this, but, and is emitting so much, you know, heat into the atmosphere. But Schmidt was saying, look, you got to let AI run because the answer to car to climate change is not necessarily reducing emissions. We're trying to reduce carbon emissions, but that might, might not be the answer. Let AI help us figure out how to take, carbon out of the atmosphere i said that to chase Ockmiller, and he like perked up he's like yes and he started he's like like alpha genius so he started talking about all these techniques to do just that so there's a lot of thought going on uh, ar around that topic so that was kind of interesting like i said stretch a was you know rob he's just he'll always find the the underbelly the achilles heel so he was like yeah google's you know, have such an issue that they're dealing so with that's Schmitz, um in the news that I saw, it's basically he was saying that, hey, screw the data center sustainability question. We're gonna we're not gonna solve climate change anyway. So let's get the AI up and running faster so that can help. That yeah, so to be his sentiment. But but it resonated with me because the reason was I was at MIT this um summer. You know how we do that that's MIT CDO conference every year. Sanjeev Mohan and I did it this year. He was awesome, by the way. And uh he was just at the Cloud Air event. And we didn't have them on. I don't know why. I mean, just maybe we didn't have time, but that's too bad. But at any rate, there, we went to this MIT museum. Um, it was like this innovation museum in Kendall Square, and they had this interactive um, model, and it was it was a pretty big kiosk. And what you could do is you could you could simulate the the climate impact and the carbon emission impact of if you like jacked up wind and solar and nuclear and you completely like went to evs and so i did it i did it with very unrealistic assumptions you know it was a model a bounded model so i jacked up all the you know the the emission friendly um techniques solar wind etc and it didn't have that much of an impact that's <laughs> oh I was like, okay, so, you know, because population growth and so many other, you know, issues that we have, um, you know, stripping the earth's topsoil on and on. So it's like, wow, so we're going to do all this stuff. We're going to mandate whatever, whatever, EVs, um, et cetera, and it's not going to really make that much of a difference. And so that Schmidt angle really resonated with me that maybe the answer is, you got to do that stuff, but taking carbon out of the atmosphere and finding techniques to do that. Yeah, I think AI will be a better uh, mechanism for reducing energy. Again, the thesis is you focus on revenue or costs. If you think about like business here, they're looking at it the same way by saying, look at, you know, we're focused on climate change. Let's get the AI up and running. Damn the torpedoes to use your word. Just get the AI up and then over time, AI will help us use less energy. Um, that's their thesis. It's kind of like hey, it's increase the revenue, but get costs. We'll make more profit. So I think that's a, I mean, interesting way to look at it. I don't necessarily disagree with them. I mean, I think if you micromanage climate change, we're like on a snail's pace right now. It feels like with um, even what is climate change? How do we fix it? How do you create a fairness around the globe when you have different countries that have different standards? What's the Chinese doing with their uh, posture to cl climate change? I mean, they're building more factories and cities than anybody else. So you have a whole international theater. So even if the U.S. was a, was doing their best, they might be still not tipping the scales when no one else is playing ball. So I think, in general, that the way I would look at it. I mean, yeah. And again, this is an industry problem. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I mean, uh, and, and so 
I don't know. I, like I said, I was struck by that narrative. It it lit a fire under you know Chase, who's when, once that video is published, you know it takes us some time because we have to sneaker net the stuff. But it, it was really good conversation. And um, all right. Well, next week, Dave is open compute uh, here in the sorry. Bay Area. Sorry, to events happening. Uh, did you see Hinton got the Nobel Prize right? And he's like, really throwing cautions out there about AI, right? And he wins the Nobel Prize. So that maybe gives that some voice as well. You know, he wants well, to tap... I mean, who do you trust? I mean, what is he... You know, okay, Nobel Prize for what? Being for a doomer? AI. Yeah, for... No, for AI, right? All the work he did he on did neural... AI doomer. All, all he did... All, all the work he did on neural networks, whatever, however many years ago with the other guy. And, and all I'm saying is that, you know, there's there's... Schmidt is on one hand saying, let's not restrict AI and tap the brakes. And then you got the other the Nobel Prize winner saying, well, hold on. And Ilya started a new company for responsible AI. Yeah, the know. California law, your, your part of the world, didn't pass. But I, my understanding is it didn't pass because Gavin Newsom wants to wants stricter um, regulations. Well, so, Dave, I mean, on the Nobel Prize these academics and you know to me you know how i feel about this i mean i love these guys doing all this great research but at the end of the day they're academics and i think you know when you have these transformational secular shifts and there's many of them coming right now um most of the academics some of the most smartest people pedigree wise and you know credentials are often quite frankly wrong and if you look at history they line up, right? <laughs> I remember the web, everyone everyone who was elite in the computer industry, yeah, this is stupid. It's not even technically sound. It's so slow. It's dialogue. That's a, this is terrible. It's a simple architecture. <laughs> it's a joke. Um, so, you know, I even worked um, before. I did my first startup in, in the 90s, HP. HP had an employee that actually invented HTML, and, and they didn't even know how big it was. They just donated them to um cern which then became the w3c and even even after the web netscape launched hp the old hp thought it was a joke as did ibm and others so it was just you know people are on the wrong side of it ken olson pc on everyone's desk that's a joke right so you know there's yeah, so many yeah, examples the best. of smart people that are too smart to even look at something and admit that it may not be super technically great compared to the work they do or whatever but momentum and market shifts happen like that. And the web, you know, the internet and the web became great. And everyone poo-pooed it. A lot of people poo-pooed it that were, quite frankly, super smart. Well, the big debate among academics, Hinton is on the camp of the AI, his, his argument is AI understands its outputs. And the other side of the camp is like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it's just... <laughs> viewing outputs it doesn't understand them at least not at this point and it's far years away from being able to understand those outputs so it's it's just uh, my only point was you now have this sort of ai caution um this person who's throwing caution around ai now wins the nobel prize and that will give it credibility and voice and to your point these academics aren't always right so i don't know what the answer is but <clears throat> i do know the answer is that you got to be very careful about regulation and trying to stipulate things that are going to change so quickly like model size and how much money you spend in the model i mean I, those things are just moving targets right so well, there's one news item that i got my attention david clark the former amazonian exec who went to the startup and then got fired abruptly because he was spending too much cash um built a whole team recruited a bunch of people and then the founder came in and turfed them um, David, Dave Clark just raised a hundred million, uh, for a supply chain startup called Augur. Um, yeah. so he's back in the game. Um, that was pretty interesting. You mentioned the peace prize. That was some news there. AMD is pushing, um, you know, bigger AI workload kind of processors, DPUs and network interface cards. So they had, they had a big push this week and, um, Google's under anti antitrust fire it looked, it was the DOJ is looking to break up the company. So that's, you know, again, and then next week is the Open Compute Project Summit in San Jose. I'm going to miss it because you and I are going to be in New York. Um, you know, we did the inaugural event there and covered it for many, many years and been covering it ever since. This year, that show is, is really big now. It's it's becoming an important infrastructure show. As infrastructure is booming, uh, that sector 
um, it's hot. I mean, you're seeing companies on the funding side. Uh, I'm hearing companies are going to double revenue on some of these chip companies. Cerebus is going to go public. You have the confluence of hardware and AI coming together. So that's going to be a big show. And of course, supercomputing is going to come up next month. Um, so it's a hardware year, Dave. It's just, and this should be the next, you know, subject for our next podcast. So gear up for that. And then obviously, you know, you know open AI pro projecting to lose 14 billion, just, you know, just Silicon angles just got again, ton of news this week and you're going to drop all your content from New York, um, from your, your show. What was the big takeaway from your interviews? What was the focus? Cause I'm curious what that stream's going to look like. So I'll give you a sense. I mean, I, I think I mentioned Sonny Singh was on. Doug Gourlay came on. He, Doug Gourlay is so good. I mean, he has really sharpened his game. Not that, I mean, Doug always had game, as you know. Mm -hmm. And now just having been at Arista and just, you know, learning from Jay Shree, who's just one of one of our business heroes, uh, he he nailed it, I thought. I mean, I, I, you know, I really liked Cumulo when they first came out and then they kind of, and I really liked their, they basically were an example of super cloud. So Doug, just so articulate and, and, and excited about the future. So that was good. I had Ivana Delevska well, on. Well, just She's on Doug real quick, because, you know, a lot of people um, might not know Doug Gorlay. He was an early Cisco guy too, knows networking. I call him, he's in the networking brain trust in the network, our, our network, very good guy. And he then went to Arista, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, one of the things about Doug is, and he and I talk about this all the time, he has this, this expression called, he likes to do things the Arista way. And if you look at Arista's success, they're they're not like Vast, where Vast is great at getting all the deals done. They're just like under the radar, and they have one formula: better offer and overperformance. And if you look at Arista, I think that's what he's trying to do with Cumulo here, which is, hey, we're just going to offer a better solution and just outperform everybody and win on the number on performance because it's just, he's a networking guy. I mean, that's like the formula. So interesting to see him take the helm at Cumulo. Again, ex Isilon guys. So you know engineering strong, Dave. So it's going to be interesting to see how this frothy training market, as it goes mainstream, the emphasis on AI safety without compromising data from a security standpoint, as data is scattered around cloud on-premise data center and edge, you got to pull it together. It's almost like, remember the old days having Akamai, you had the cache of images and the old internet yep. days. Yeah, I think well, data is going to go through that kind of Akamai CDN vibe, which is, hey, I got to have it everywhere. So I'm going to keep an eye on that. And again, training languages are commoditized. Inference is where the action is. It's a massive opportunity. Distributed training is another concept that's coming out. So watch Cumulo. You that's nailed it. You nailed it. He's betting big on, on data growth. And then so we basically held a CI, not basically, we held a CXO summit with the Cube plus NYSE Wired which is their, you know, community. And it was a media week, just like you had a media week a couple of weeks ago. And I had a chief information or sorry, chief investment officer of Spear Invest, Ivana Delevska. So she's, you know, heavily invested in NVIDIA and AMD. She's paired her snowflake. Interesting. And she was a real mm -hmm. snowflake bull. So that's a great conversation. We had the CTO of Neo4j on, who's doing some amazing things with Graph. Sonny Singh, I mentioned, um, who was he was awesome digging into what's happening in banking. Um, we had uh, uh, high touch and hangout. <laughs> hangout was really interesting. They're basically doing some really cool stuff with with music, like social media with music. Um, we had uh, we we had uh, Brian's brother's company on uh, Perlion, who does uh, 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 cyber resiliency uh and recovery uh, with guys like dell and, and netapp we had janine sneed on from who's the uh, runs ibm expert labs that was cool we had the cfo of sysdig karen walker bobby patrick came on to give us a little ui path forward preview i talked about lambda we had the CISO of cribble on we had we had a bunch of CISOs. andy i talked about andy pernsteiner from vast and then the ceo of crusoe um we had Vercel on. I mean, it's just just an amazing amount of innovative content. And the great thing, it was we went anywhere. That was like no prep, showed up, just like like OG Cube, John. It was really, really good. Yeah, I'm going to be there on the 22nd. 
to the 24th, I'm doing infrastructure leaders, East coast. We did the West coast one here a month and a half ago. Um, I'm t on Wednesday. I'm doing space telecom and networking leaders because um, NYC is having a big space event in their facility. So it's an NYC. I'm going to piggyback on that and just pull some guests in as well as bring in some industries. And then um, Thursday I'm doing finance, um, venture capital and private equity because it's private equity week. So that's going to be on tap. The thing that I'm really excited about though, after that, Dave, is that there's a huge startup appetite too. I just got off um, a meeting yesterday with a bunch of people that want to do a startup focused week. Um, right. So um, that should be great. So again, I noticed that last time I, uh, I was there, um, the trip before. And the last one is that, you know, sprinkled in on these thematic, cool executive conversations is, is like a ton of founders and they're accelerating fast. Remember we talked about that many, many pods ago, how fast you can get your startup up and running. I mean, solopreneurs are a hot topic even today still. So, you know, the, the, these teams are getting some seed funding pre-seed 5 million, which is like awesome. Uh, but they just blow through their series a, and they don't need to build huge companies on the go to market. So you're seeing again, that phenomenon of that wave changing the economic landscape of how startups are built. So what's happening in New York is it's very capital efficient in there when they're, when they, when they got the concentration of, of that, that Metro area, tons of talent, it's expensive to live there kind of like Silicon Valley now. So it's, it's not like it's affordable, but the economics of, you don't have to hire a hundred people. Yeah. And, and New York is so happening. And then, but we're, what we're doing in, and at our studio in NYSE, we're running thematic editorials. So if you got ideas and you, you know, your team is down there, but um, I know you're tight on time, but can we talk about the breaking up Google and whether or not that's a good idea? <laughs> Two minutes go. <laughs> Every time a big dominant company comes out, some bureaucrat says we got to break them up. And, uh, you know, it's like we heard that with IBM. We heard that with AT&T. In fact, they did break up AT&T, and Lena Khan uses that. I always call it revisionist history. But I'll, I'll ask you, John, what really changed the network? What really disrupted the network? It wasn't the breakup of AT&T. It was wireless networks. It was the shift of Pakistan. You and I always debate the Microsoft thing. I think you and I just, like, we'll just arm wrestle that till they're dead. You have an opinion. Well, but, have an opinion. But, 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 but things take, like that, Microsoft and these breakups. But stay I'm, with AT&T for just a second, because what happened was, it, Lena Khan takes credit for all the time, but it was the 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 shift to wireless. It was the shift to packet switch networks, the sh switch to broadband that really affected. It was the the market shift, and yeah. so what you got was a bunch of little baby bells. They even said that recently that this idea of breaking up Google. I don't think it's going to happen, but they use, they use it as a as a threat to try to get them to 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 behave, which is they should behave. But we saw this with Microsoft. A decade of antitrust ended up nothing—a big nothing burger. Um, there were little, there were moves like you know forcing Intel to sort of open up to to AMD. That saved AMD, so that's that's a good thing. Very narrow remedies work. And I'm that's with you on this, Dave. I think you're right about this idea that the government comes in just too late. It's a day late and a dollar short, as they say. They they just they they see it and then they got to go after it. But they should have done the work on the front end if they were going to do anything. They tend to react to what they think is perceived power, but the game's already over. And if you and if 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 all things considered, it was a simple static market, that'd be okay. But it's not. The market's changing. So your point about these secular trends, you can go after um, an AT and T or the baby bells and the, the, the AT&T and then the baby bells became regional. That didn't cause it. That caused more problems. I mean, the, the last right. mile was one big monopoly, the, the regional bell operating companies, the Arbox, remember? And then Back. you have the Microsoft. So all oh. these things happen post haste. And we lost Bell Labs. Bell Labs gone. Nokia owns it now. It lost the U.S. You know, Research Center. Gone. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, again... Right. I think what's going to happen is, and this is where the AI health uh, climate change argument, you can apply almost that to to, to regulation. Just get the AI, AI going and let it let it do the predictive generative AI action and give lawmakers and people in policy positions better information. Um, and then the tech industry just has to be better at educating the government and, you know, knowing, you know, and having a, a pragmatic view, not just a narrow view. So again, I think, I think 
it's hopeless at this point. It's kind of like it's never going to happen unless something changes. And I think that's the same argument that Eric Schmidt was making around, you know, data centers, build them faster, get the AI going. That'll help us with climate change on the back end. Uh, I think the same yep. thing is true. You can almost argue that for 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 that too. So, well, let, let's pick that up next week. We'll let's get some guests on. Maybe get some uh, get get Lena Khan to come on. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I'd love to have Lena Khan. I'll see you in New York. We're gonna heading down there for uh, some more interviews. We're gonna do a visit to IBM, meet the CEO Irvin Krishna and team, um, and find out what's going on there and see what's innovative with IBM. Our our good friend Bruno Aziza is now VP yes. of analytics. So that's huge news. So uh Bruno, good friend of the queue. He's also a creator too. He does the car cast, which I love. I'm doing um, a sit down with him, you know, next week. Did you know that? Yes, I saw that on the schedule. I would have sat down with him here in Palo Alto, but I'm happy, I'll do it formally over there. But you know, you know, he's Alto. been a great big data guy from day one. If you remember when we started the cube 15 years ago, Bruno was one of our first friends of the cube that understood the big picture. Um, he understood the, the technology, he understood the trends. He is good. And so it was a good pickup by IBM. I think he got bored at Google Capital. <laughs> He's back in the game. Um, yeah. yeah. He's great. And being an investor's heart, it's like Groundhog Day. It's the same thing every day. You know, people come in, pitch ideas, and you got to you know, pick a winner out of 3,000. So, all right, Dave, we'll see you next week. This Cube Pod, a little bit shorter this week. Just getting off the road. Again, this is road time, fall season. Check out siliconangle.com. And again, hit us up on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp. All channels are open. If you got any ideas, you got any ideas for what we're doing at the Cube and the studios, any themes you think that we should be programming around, you can see a lot more content coming from us, a lot more velocity, I think, in the next six months with our new technology coming out from the Cube platform. You'll see a lot more content creation, a lot more community participation. You're going to see a couple more new collective members joining our team haven't been announced yet. So keep an eye on the cube and it's looking at angle. Of course, the cube research.com has got the best research out there right now. It's all free. We're going to mission is to offer that for free. Always keeping it out there for everyone to use and share and make better decisions. Keeping that data fresh, high frequency and on point. Dave, see you next time. Hey, John, have a good weekend.